In this video, our topic is electromagnetic interactions in conducting loops. These interactions can lead to phenomena that we may not expect. For example, we see in our sketch that by passing a permanent magnet through the loops of a conducting coil, current is generated in that coil, and the direction of the current changes as we change the motion of the magnet through the loops. In this lesson, we'll learn how this happens, and we'll also study the relative directions of changing magnetic fields and changing currents. As we get started, let's consider this simplified setup. Say that we've got a permanent magnet here with a north and a south pole, and then a loop of conducting wire is below the magnet with an ammeter, a device for measuring current, in it. If we keep our magnet and our loop of wire stationary, then we know that the current readout on our ammeter will be zero. There's no current in this loop. But still, there's more going on here than we can see. Recall that any permanent magnet creates a magnetic field around itself. If we could see those field lines, they might look like this. And because these field lines always point from the north pole of a magnet toward the south pole, we know that the directions associated with them look like this. With these field lines visible, we can see that some of them are passing through our circular conducting loop. Seeing magnetic field lines pass through some area like this can remind us of magnetic flux. Written as a symbol, we typically express magnetic flux using phi sub m, and we know it's equal to the strength of a magnetic field experienced by some cross-sectional area A. Looking back to our permanent magnet and conducting loop, we can see that here we have a cross-sectional area, and we also have a magnetic field B generated by our magnet. All this tells us that, at this moment in time, even before our magnet begins to move with respect to our loop, there is some non-zero amount of magnetic flux linked to this loop. But nonetheless, as we see our ammeter showing us, there's still no current induced in the loop. So this is our setup, and now let's say we change it by letting our magnet fall downward through the loop. When we do this, the first thing we may notice as the magnet begins to fall is that the current I on our ammeter moves off of zero. In other words, as the magnet is in motion, there is some induced current in our loop. A second thing we can take note of is that the magnetic flux through our loop is changing. It's not that the area of our loop is changing, that's staying constant, but what is varying in time is the magnetic field that passes through the loop. As our magnet falls, the strength of the vertical component of the magnetic field passing through our loop varies. So then, here's what we know so far in terms of magnetic flux and induced current. If we consider this quantity here, which is a change in magnetic flux divided by a change in time, if we recall back to a moment ago where our permanent magnet was stationary above the loop, at that instant, the change in magnetic flux over time through the loop was zero. And corresponding to this, we saw that no current was induced in our conductor. But on the other hand, when we dropped our permanent magnet so that it was in motion through our loop, then in that case, the change in magnetic flux per unit time was not zero through the loop, and when that happened, current was indeed induced. It turns out that these two findings are true in general, and they're described mathematically by a law called Faraday's Law. Now, interestingly, Faraday's Law doesn't explicitly mention current, but it does describe EMF. And if we think about it, EMF, or voltage, is a necessary precursor to current. No charge will flow in a loop, no current will exist in it, without an EMF across it. So Faraday's law describes EMF, and it says it's equal to negative a constant, and we'll talk about that constant in a moment, multiplied by the time rate of change of magnetic flux. To better understand this equation, let's consider this factor right here, delta phi sub m. We've seen that when delta phi sub m is zero, that means no EMF and therefore no current is induced, and that when it's non-zero, some current is induced, and therefore so is EMF, but to understand what that means for there to be a change in magnetic flux, let's go back to our definition of that term here. If we decide to modify this expression so that we're looking not at magnetic flux, but a change in that flux, then that means we would insert this symbol delta, representing change, in front of both sides of the equation. In order for delta phi sub m to not be zero then, there needs to be either some change in the magnetic field or some change in the area that field is passing through or a change in both. Just to consider a quick example, say that we had a uniform magnetic field that was directed into the screen, and that in a plane perpendicular to that field direction, we had a circular conducting loop. Now, if our field was constant in time, it didn't get stronger or weaker or change direction, 
And if the area of our conducting loop that was exposed to the field also didn't change in time, in other words, the ring didn't grow or shrink or rotate, then we would have both a constant magnetic field and a constant area exposed to that field. In this case, the change in magnetic flux would then be zero, and therefore, no EMF would be induced in our loop, and so no current would travel through it. But then, we could imagine a different scenario. Let's say that over some amount of time, and we can call that delta T, our magnetic field strength increased. So even though the area of our loop exposed to the field hasn't changed, B has, it's gone up. This means that delta phi sub m, the change in magnetic flux, is not equal to zero, and therefore, this change in magnetic flux will lead to an EMF induced in the loop, and then a current. We start to see then how important these delta symbols are in Faraday's law. It's not enough for there to simply be some amount of magnetic flux. That amount needs to change over time in order for an EMF to be induced. We could say that this fraction here, delta phi sub m over delta t, is the most important part of Faraday's law. But in order for this law to be accurate, for the equation to be true, we also need this constant we mentioned earlier and this negative sign. Let's first explain this constant capital N. Remember that on our opening screen, we had a coil of wire with a number of turns in it. This meant that when our permanent magnet passed through the coil, it passed through each one of these loops. Each one of these individual turns, we have one, two, three, four in our coil here, multiplies the EMF that's induced in a coil when a magnet is passed through it. Let's say that this coil consists of just one loop. And let's say further that when a magnet passes through this one loop, it induces an EMF, and we'll just call that EMF E sub 1. If we were to then double the number of loops in our coil by adding 1, then the EMF induced when a magnet passed through would be 2 E1. And if we tripled that number, we would get 3 times the original EMF, and so on. That's how the number of loops multiplies the EMF induced. The constant n in our Faraday's law equation represents that number. However many loops we have, 1 or 7 or 1,000, so long as the change in magnetic flux per unit time is the same through each one, then we take that change and multiply it by n to give us the magnitude of the EMF induced overall. Now, the last part of Faraday's law to consider is this negative sign. It's not always necessary to take this minus sign into account, say for example if we wanted to solve just for the magnitude of EMF induced in some scenario, but the physical significance of this sign is important. Let's consider again this situation where we have a permanent magnet that's being dropped through a conducting loop. As the magnet fell from its original position, roughly here, to here, we said that the magnetic flux through our conducting loop changed. Not because the area of that loop changed with respect to the field, that stayed constant, but rather the strength of the magnetic field increased over this time. And that's because the north pole of our magnet got closer and closer to the plane of the loop. If we were to draw then the change in magnetic field through this loop over this interval of time, we would say that that change points downward. We could also say that the magnetic field is increasing in the downward direction. This change in field leads to a change in flux, which, when this change happens over some amount of time, leads to an EMF and therefore a current induced in this loop. There's something interesting about that current, though. The direction of the current induced in the loop is such that it opposes the change in magnetic flux through the loop. The way this happens, the way this current opposes the change in magnetic flux, is by traveling in a direction such that the current itself produces a magnetic field that points the opposite way. We could call this magnetic field B induced, B sub IND. This is the field created by the current induced in the loop. And it's always the case that induced current resists a change in magnetic flux. This rule is called Lenz's rule or Lenz's law. The fact that induced current creates a magnetic field that opposes a change in magnetic flux is the reason behind the negative sign in Faraday's law. The EMF that's induced in a conducting loop due to a change in magnetic flux through it will drive current that creates an induced magnetic field, we've called it B sub IND, that works against or opposes the change in magnetic flux originally experienced by the loop. We could say then that an induced EMF, and therefore an induced current, fights against change to the system. It tries to keep things the same by counteracting changes the system experiences. Now, to be a bit more clear about all these directions involved, let's clear a bit of space on this diagram. And even though we've removed the permanent magnet from our sketch, let's say that it is actually still falling through the loop. 
So in other words, the change in magnetic field, and therefore the change in magnetic flux experienced by the loop, points down. As we mentioned, this will cause a current to be induced in the loop, which generates a magnetic field, which opposes this change delta B. The question then is, which way does current point in this loop in order to generate such a field B sub I N D? To figure this out, we can use what's called a right hand rule. In this rule, we point the thumb of our right hand in the direction of the induced magnetic field. Next, we curl our fingers closed, and the direction of that curl tells us which way current points in our loop to generate such a field B induced. In the case of our loop here, this would indicate charge moving in this direction around the loop. And here, we could call this current I induced because it is induced by the changing magnetic flux due to the magnet that is actually falling through this loop. Knowing all this, let's get some practice now with these ideas through an example exercise. A loop of wire with radius 15 centimeters moves perpendicularly to a uniform 0.25 tesla magnetic field at a constant speed, as shown in the diagram. The motion takes 1.5 seconds to complete. Find the electromotive force induced in the loop. In our diagram, we see a uniform magnetic field pointed out of the screen at us, and moving perpendicularly to that is this loop of wire. We see its original position here and then its final position here. So this loop of wire moves like this at a constant speed, and the complete motion takes 1.5 seconds. Knowing all this, we want to solve for the electromotive force, or EMF, induced in the loop. To help us do that, we can recall Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction. This law tells us that the EMF induced in a conducting loop is proportional to the change in magnetic flux, delta phi sub m, through that loop, divided by a change in time. We can recall further that magnetic flux in general, phi sub m, is equal to a magnetic field strength through some area exposed to that field. In our application, this area would specifically be the cross-sectional area of some conducting loop. So Faraday's law tells us that we need to have a change in magnetic flux, in other words, a change in phi sub m, in order for any EMF to be induced in some conducting loop. And the way that happens, the way there is a non-zero change in magnetic flux, is if there is correspondingly a non-zero change, either in the magnetic field strength or in the area exposed to that field. In other words, for delta phi sub m not to be zero, either b needs to change, or a, or both b and a. Knowing this, let's look back at our scenario. We have a loop of wire that moves perpendicularly to a uniform magnetic field. Now, the fact that our magnetic field is uniform tells us that this magnetic field here, in our equation for delta phi sub m, does not change. In our situation, we can say that delta b is zero. That's the meaning of the field being uniform. Nonetheless, we can still have a changing magnetic flux so long as the area exposed to our uniform field is changing in time. But then, our problem statement tells us that our loop is moving perpendicularly to the field. This means that its initial area exposed to that field is this area here, and its final area is equal to that initial area. Therefore, the area exposed to our magnetic field doesn't change, which means that delta A is equal to zero. And if both delta A and delta B equal zero, as they do, then taken together, that implies that delta phi sub m, the change in magnetic flux, is also zero. And then since this is true, as we revisit Faraday's law, we see that if delta phi sub m in this equation equals zero, then so does the induced EMF. And so, because neither the magnetic field nor the area that field passes through changes, the electromotive force induced in this loop is zero volts. Let's take a moment now to summarize what we've learned about electromagnetic interactions in conducting loops. In this lesson, we saw that a change in magnetic flux over time through a conducting loop induces an electromotive force in that loop. This is described by Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction. We saw further that when EMF is induced, it generates a current which creates a magnetic field whose direction opposes the change in magnetic flux originally experienced by the loop. So if we had a loop and a change in magnetic flux directed downward through it, then the EMF induced in the loop would generate a current which creates a magnetic field in this opposite direction. We call this the induced magnetic field, and we note that it's caused by the induced current. And lastly, we saw that the direction of this induced current is determined by what's called a right-hand rule. 
Using this rule, we point the thumb on our right hand in the direction of the induced magnetic field, the one that opposes the change in magnetic flux, and we then curl our fingers. And it's the direction of this curl that tells us the way induced current points. This is a summary of electromagnetic interactions in conducting loops.